And so as we begin this evening, if you'd like to just turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew and to chapter 6. We were in Mark 6 to, uh, this morning, but this evening uh, let's look together at Matthew chapter 6. And I'm going to be reading verses 1 to 21. 1 to 21. Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret." And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. Let me begin by telling you about John. John Kendall Morgan. He was a helicopter pilot. He was young. He was fit. He was handsome. And very much in love. He actually married his childhood sweetheart and then went off to war, to the Gulf, to fight in Operation Desert Storm. But before going, he left behind a letter and on the envelope, in big, bold, black writing, these words, just in case. Well, on the 28th of February, 1991, a knock came to the door and two officers passed on the tragic news. We're so sorry to tell you, but John has been killed in action by an Iraqi missile. Obviously, the family was absolutely devastated. They picked up the envelope marked, just in case. The letter inside read, to those I love, 
if you've opened this letter, don't worry. Jesus is with me. Now I know what you don't know. I know what heaven is like. Have you ever wondered what heaven must be like? You say, hold on, isn't there a verse in the Bible that says, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. If that's true, then we can't know what heaven is like. The Bible says so. Well, the only problem is that's just half or part of the verse. It actually says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us. How? By his Spirit. And if you look at the context, a couple of verses later you'll find that God has revealed this to us by his Spirit. Where? In his Word. And so 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 is a wonderful passage and yet it's misquoted and misused and it means the exact opposite from what we think it's saying. And so in answering this question, what's heaven like? We can't use speculation or imagination or assumption, no. If God has revealed it to us by his Spirit in his word, then we need to use revelation. It's not what I think or you think or anyone else thinks. It's what the Bible tells us that counts. Okay, we'll entitle this series, Where Do We Go From Here? We'll call this introduction, Heavens Above. And let me point out some things just to set the scene to begin with. Heavens above, its prominence. It's surprising to me how very little heaven is spoken about in lots of churches. I became a Christian when I was 17 and I've never heard a series on heaven. Some sermons, yes, of course, but not a whole series. As well as that, I had a look at some of my theology books here in my study. Here they are up there. And guess what? Heaven's hardly discussed anywhere. Lots about God and Christ and salvation and scripture and the church and baptism and communion and hell. Chapters and all of the above, but relatively little on heaven. A few pages here and there, if that. And yet the fact of the matter is, although heaven isn't prominent in today's preaching or teaching or even in yesterday's theology books, it's extremely prominent in the Bible. It's all over the place. Do you realise that heaven's mentioned over 550 times in the Bible? In Old Testament Hebrew and New Testament Greek, the word means high, lofty or raised up. And so every time heaven's mentioned, it's always spoken of as up, always up. Jesus coming down from heaven and going back up into heaven. The apostle John was given a vision of heaven. And from heaven, God said to him, come up here. Heaven's always up. And it's a term, it's a word repeated over and over again. In fact, you wouldn't have a Bible left if you removed all the references to heaven. Heaven is prominent. Sadly, maybe not in our hearts or our thoughts or our churches or our preaching or our well-loved theology books, but it's certainly prominent in the Bible. And so to begin with, heaven's above its prominence. And then secondly, heaven's above its plurality. Did you know there are three heavens? You say, hold on a minute, I'm just trying to get my head around one heaven and now you're telling me there are three heavens. Well, whenever Paul wrote to the Corinthian Christians in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he talked about being caught up to the third heaven. And later on, he calls this third heaven 
paradise. Now, obviously, if there's a third heaven, there must be a first heaven and a second heaven. So let me explain what these three heavens are. The first heaven is the sky, the atmosphere, or the atmospheric heaven. That's the first heaven. The blanket of air immediately surrounding the earth, where the birds fly and the clouds move. In Genesis chapter 1, we find that God said, let birds fly above the earth, across the expanse of the heavens. The first heaven then is the heaven we see as we look up, the sky, the atmosphere, the atmospheric heavens. The second heaven is the stratosphere, space. Listen to Genesis chapter 1 again. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. That's the stellar heavens, outer space, where God placed the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets. So the first heaven is the sky. The second heaven is space. The third heaven is God's heaven where God resides. Didn't Jesus teach us to pray, Our Father in heaven? Again he said in Matthew chapter 5, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Or in Psalm 11, The Lord is in his holy temple, his throne is in heaven. Not the first heaven, not the second heaven, but the third heaven. Not the sky, not space, but the heaven of heavens. That's a phrase taken from Solomon's prayer at the opening of the Old Testament Jewish temple. Even the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, O God. You're so big, you're so vast. Heaven's too small for you. We know that God is everywhere, don't we? All at once. And yet this third heaven is where he has his seat of power, his throne, if you like, his headquarters. So, heavens above, its prominence and its plurality. And then heavens above, its pictures. How does the Bible picture heaven? Let me give you a quick summary of what we're told. Are you ready? Heaven's described, heaven's pictured as a kingdom, a perfect kingdom, with Jesus as the great and gracious king, everything under his supreme sovereignty, where he rules and reigns over all. We get different windows into this idea of Christ's kingdom throughout the Bible. For example, in the book of Daniel, he speaks about the Son of Man. And that's the favourite title Jesus used of himself in the Gospels, over 80 times in the Gospels. The Son of Man. And on each occasion what he's saying is this, the one foreshadowed, the one predicted in Daniel, is me, says Jesus. I'm the Son of Man. So keep that in mind as we read what Daniel says, pointing to Jesus. Daniel chapter 7. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days, that's God the Father, and was presented before him. To him, the son of man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away 
and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Verse 18. And the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. I love that, don't you? What will it look like when there aren't nations competing with nations? No more rulers vying for power and dominance, but one kingdom and one king. And no wars, because the Prince of Peace presides. This is the hope of every true believer. So, a kingdom, and not only a kingdom, but a city, according to Hebrews 11, a city whose builder and maker is God. According to Revelation, there is no need for the sun in that city. We'll live in the light of the unveiled glory of Jesus. He's the light of the celestial city. When Jesus claimed to be the light of the world, he wasn't using hyperbole. No, it was prophecy. And we find that the gates of that city are never shut. No lockdowns, no quarantine, no restrictions, no social distancing. And in the ancient world, when you went to a city, you were allowed in if your name was listed. Only then could you enter. Well, the Bible tells us that to enter heaven's city, your name must be written in the Lamb's book of life. Here's the gospel. Our God Jesus came into human history. He lived and died and rose again to open up the gates of this city. And when I give myself and my sin to Jesus and ask him for his forgiveness, my name goes on to the guest list and he takes me to his city. With so much bad news, here's some good news to look forward to. I'm bound for that city. So a kingdom and a city. And then heavens compared to a house or a home. Jesus called it the Father's house. It's the idea of family and friendship and fellowship and safety and security and warmth and welcome. What's more, heaven's like a garden, a gorgeous garden. Of course, the Bible begins with a garden, the paradise of God. Garden means paradise. And the Bible ends with a garden. And you remember Jesus spoke to the dying thief about going to paradise. With me in paradise. Again, the book of Revelation describes God's gorgeous garden. Pure paradise. Crystal-like rivers. The tree of life and fruit for all the nations. Of course, it's figurative language. So our appetites might be whetted. The Bible says so much more about heaven. A kingdom, a city, a house, a garden, and a party. Isn't that wonderful? A party. The idea of celebration, a feast, a banquet, joy unspeakable, unimaginable, unsurpassed joy. Once more, let me say, God's accommodating us. He's coming down to our level. He's using picturesque language. He's speaking in ways that we understand so we might grasp something of its amazing wonder. And you see how it goes from, from this to this, from immensity to intimacy, a kingdom, a city, a house, a family home, a garden of beauty and splendour, and a garden party where we can celebrate unendingly. So there we have a brief overview of the Bible's take on heaven. So heaven's above its prominence, heaven's above its plurality, heaven's above its pictures, lastly its preciousness. Everything precious to us is there. Our Father's in heaven. We quoted earlier Luke chapter 11. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. And our saviors in heaven, imagine Jesus coming and bleeding and dying for sinners like us. And yet he did. He came for us. He lived for us. He suffered and bled and died for us. Don't you love him? Of course we do. And he's in heaven. Well, if that's where he is, the lover of our souls, isn't that where we want to be? Where Jesus is, tis heaven there. I love what it says in Hebrews 9, Christ has entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. That's where he is. Later in Revelation, we discover he's the centre of heaven, the theme of heaven's song, the object of heaven's worship, the focal point of heaven's praise. It's Jesus who will make heaven, heaven. He'll outshine and outstrip and outdo everything and everyone else. Our fathers in heaven, our saviors in heaven. And what about our fellow believers? They're in heaven, all the saved, of all ages past are in heaven. Old Testament saints, New Testament saints are there. In the book of Hebrews it talks about the spirits of the justified made perfect. And our loved ones are in heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Sudden death, sudden glory. Escorted by angels right into the courts of heaven. 21 years ago, my mum died. Caleb was very young at the time. And a few weeks later, he was asked in school by his teacher to write about his family. Here's what he wrote. I have two grannies and two grandas. I have a granny and a granda who live in Northern Ireland, Alison's mum and dad. I have a granda who lives in Scotland, my dad. And I have a granny who lives in heaven. Out of the mouth of a child, simple, straightforward, sorted and sure. Heaven just as real as here, absolutely. Thankfully, heaven will mean reunion. It's not goodbye, it's just good night. We're going to see them again in the morning. Our loved ones are there. That makes heaven precious, doesn't it? And something else are treasures in heaven. Again, Jesus said in Matthew 6, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And what's more, our rewards in heaven. Jesus said in Matthew 5, Rejoice! And be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. We may not have much down here, but we have, according to Peter, an inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled and doesn't fade away, reserved in heaven for us. As well as that, our names are written down in heaven. You remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 10 to his disciples, Rejoice that your names are written down in heaven. And our citizenship is in heaven. Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven from where we eagerly wait for our Saviour, says Paul. I may be a citizen of the United Kingdom. I have a Halewood postcode L26 but I've really got a different postcode altogether, a different address. I'm a citizen of heaven most of all. We don't belong here. We're aliens, strangers, pilgrims. We belong somewhere else. We're not from this world, literally. We're from another world altogether. And so absolutely everything precious to us is in heaven. Everything of value to us is there. All that we cherish and treasure and love is in heaven. So, heaven's above its prominence, its plurality, its pictures, 
and its preciousness. I've got some questions. What about your heart? What about your gaze, your mind set? Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, set your affection or your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. We need to be far more heavenly minded, don't we? A mindset that's out of this world. A high and holy focus. Living life not for here and now, but for there and then. Loosening our grip on this present age and tightening our grip on that which is to come. You've heard someone say, haven't you, so-and-so's too heavenly minded to be of any earthly use. Well, Jesus was heavenly minded and he was of great earthly use. So where's your heart? What do you love most, earth or heaven, here or there? The Apostle Paul was in a quandary, a dilemma, whether to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, or stay here. And we get this sense that Paul is, is homesick, he's longing for heaven. What about your heart? And what about your joy? That's important. Tell me, are you a circumstantial Christian? Dictated to by circumstances, by what happens around you? Most are okay when everything's okay. It's fine if it's fine. But when things go wrong, it all comes tumbling down. Nothing to hold on to and we lose perspective. You remember the disciples in Luke chapter 10. Jesus sends them out in mission, but it doesn't work out. They're failures and they're down in the mouth, down in the dumps and nearly down and out. But Jesus says to them, listen, don't rejoice that the demons, the spirits are subject to you, rather rejoice in this, that your names are written down in heaven. That which is sealed and signed and sure and settled, that which is done and dusted, that should be the source of your joy. The Apostle Paul says, whether I live or whether I die, I am the Lord's. It's a win-win situation. This realm or the next realm. I'm his forever, forever his. That's all that matters. So what about your heart? And what about your joy? And what about your treasure? That's a key question as well. Rockefeller was said to be the wealthiest American of all time. At his funeral, someone asked the question, I wonder how much he left. The answer came back, he left everything. There's only one thing we can take from here to there, and it's what we do for Jesus. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Investing, storing up eternal treasure in the bank of heaven souls, service, our time, our talents, our treasure, building equity in heaven. So there it is. Where do we go from here? Heaven's above. That should change the way we live, shouldn't it? The way we do life. We'll set the stage. Next time, knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. <laughs>